So by way of disclosure, I have no financial conflicts of interest related to this presentation. And uh, fluoroquiline is considered investigational in both Canada and the United States. And so this presentation describes the investigational uses of this agent. Um, so um, I think everyone in this room is, is aware of, of the um, epidemiology of prostate cancer and some of the dilemmas related to screening and diagnosis of this disease. It's a disease characterized by a very high incidence but a variable course. And so the majority of patients found by screening, they will ultimately not die of the disease and the number needed to treat to um, save uh, one patient from prostate cancer death has been estimated at 45 and the number needed to screen is, is in the thousands. And so even the, the current guidelines by the American Urologic Association recommends uh, only shared decision making, I guess that means counseling, uh, for only men between the ages of 55 and 69. And that's based on the, the sweet spot for screening, which is the number needed to screen of, is 1,000 to save one life. Uh, nonetheless, prostate cancer is still the second leading cause of cancer death in both Canada and the US. And primary treatment, while it's uh, life-saving, uh, it still has a significant negative impact on quality of life. And recurrence rates do vary based on the um, risk factors that a patient has at the time of diagnosis. And it can vary from anywhere from 5% to upwards of 40 to 50%. And so, you know, we wish for screening to identify these high-risk patients, but um, the treatments are not necessarily that ideal, at least at this time, uh, for um, rendering them to be disease-free. The other thing that we're all probably aware of is that prostate cancer follows a uh, continuum and progression through a, ver a variety of disease states. Most patients in Western countries are diagnosed at a, um, a localized stage, early stage. Um, they're usually asymptomatic by screening, and this is a large number of patients. Primary treatment will uh, be effective in about half of them, but many go on to develop uh, what we call biochemical recurrence, in which case they undergo subsequent treatments, and uh, some of those do respond, and they may die of other things. So the um, number of patients that continue to progress uh, diminishes, but because of the low, very high denominator, uh, the number of people who do progress to this uh, lethal stage is still high, and so it's uh, just uh, behind lung cancer in terms of uh, death rate. Uh, at this point, also, the disease is now metastatic. It's changed uh, biologically, and, and most patients are symptomatic. And so um, uh, while many of us do focus on treating uh, cancer here at the time of diagnosis, there's been a lot of advancements on this end of the spectrum, and so we should be aware that everything we do at each point does affect things downstream. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for imaging to make an impact at all of these uh, clinical states. Um, so at the time of diagnosis, I think there's a, a great opportunity for imaging to not only risk stratify the patient, but also assist in treatment planning. Uh, I'm, I'm not mentioning the use of imaging for uh, diagnosing or screening, um, uh, because the operating characteristics of such an imaging modality would have to be very different from the ones that are applied at these stages, and also it's probably not going to be uh, very easy to get it through in our current uh, uh, healthcare economic situation, as well as the uh, current state of, at least in the United States, our FDA. It's going to be near impossible to get a screening imaging modality approved. So uh, choline PET has been investigated at all of those various states. Um, it's, uh, for PET imaging, uh, you combine the choline moiety, and choline is a very small molecule, but uh, when combined with either fluorine-18 or carbon-11 uh, in either ethyl, methyl, or deuterated uh, configurations, it has been shown to be successful at detecting both uh, local uh, primary prostate cancer and metastatic cancer. Choline itself is an essential nutrient, uh, comes from the diet, and is the substrate for cell membrane synthesis. And upregulated choline kinase has been identified in many malignancies. And so the intercellular trapping of choline, which forms the basis of PET imaging, uh, is mediated by this enzyme. And it, that's very analogous to FDG PET, where uh, FDG is phosphorylated by hexokinase to trap it in the cell. And um, it's been 
um, used uh, for both detection of early stage and advanced stage cancer. Its current status in 2014 is that it's not US FDA approved. There are IND applications on file and the US National Cancer Institute does have a draft new drug application, but um, that's pretty much where it's at right now. I think um, everyone doing research in, in choline-based imaging should have an appreciation of the biology of choline. Uh, choline is transported intercellularly by uh, at least three different families of choline transporters, and once in the cell, it's phosphorylated to phosphorylcholine, and that's the substrate for phosphatidylcholine synthesis. And this is part of the uh, Kennedy pathway for um, phospholipid metabolism. Uh, this pathway has both an anabolic arm, uh, but there's also a catabolic arm where phosphatidylcholine is broken down to produce a, uh, a number of metabolites, including glycerophosphocholine. And MR spectroscopy is also used to measure choline metabolism, and uh, in vitro NMR can distinguish uh, the concentrations of phosphocholine and, and glycerophosphocholine as two separate peaks near that 3.2 parts per million. But uh, in vivo, it, it's, it's less than an ideal situation, and so those two peaks are somewhat merged together, and so uh, MR spectroscopy can measure the, what they, what's described as total choline, which is uh, actually phosphocholine plus a number of other metabolites, both anabolic and catabolic. Um, so uh, PET imaging with, with choline tracers, it's a little bit more myopic. Like most PET tracers, it only measures one thing. And so we're measuring the synthesis of phosphocholine, and we believe that it's, uh, this, it's fated to eventually be part of the cell membrane. But um, what's um, not as well recognized is that phosphocholine also plays a role as a second messenger along a number of uh, signal transduction pathways that are important in cancer. And so uh, a number of growth factor receptors require phosphocholine to uh, continue activation along the serine threonine cascade, including um, RAS, uh, PI3K, and AKT, which is important for survival signaling, requires phosphocholine to kind of glue these two molecules together to continue along their signaling along the mTOR pathway. And so uh, phosphocholine has both a structural and functional role. And so when you, when you look at this image, uh, you know, it intuitively might be uh, interpreted as areas where there's uh, cancer growing, but perhaps it might reflect some other process besides uh, cellular duplication. Um, so I was interested in this early on uh, when we were doing uh, radiopathologic correlation studies. And so uh, I think many of the researchers in this room are familiar with the step section technique. So just quickly, um, we obtained the whole specimen, did an ex vivo MRI, embedded it, uh, sliced it, step sectioning with a deli slicer, whole mount, and then we did radiopathologic correlation. And, and we didn't have the benefit of anyone like Aaron Ward. So all of our radiopathologic correlation was manual. And so our confidence in doing this correlation was limited to the, on the sextant level of resolution. So we compared sextants and looked at the cancers within those sextants. And what we found was that the, the malignantly involved sextants did have higher SUV. And we identified the dominant tumors within those sextants. And, uh, stain them for the, with using the uh, MIB-1 uh, antibody to uh, compute the KI-67 proliferation index, which is the immunohistochemical marker of, of cell proliferation. And what we found was that there was uh, no correlation between um, our uptake on PET and this measure of um, cell proliferation. The uh, correlation was 0.12. So even though we were doing sextant level correspondence, we felt that it's, it's unlikely that what we're seeing on the image is a reflection of tumor growth. There must be something else going on. And so I became more interested in um, perhaps the signaling role of, of choline. Uh, you know, this pathway is very important, not just for uh, promoting survival, but it also induces apoptosis resistance and another, a, a number of other uh, cancer-related uh, features. So choline has a number of well-recognized non-structural roles. It's a substrate for acetyl transferase to produce acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. And carbon-11 choline was initially developed 
to, to uh, perform brain imaging to look at this uh, neuroreceptor pathway. It was developed in Japan, and when they didn't even see any uptake in the brain, um, it was kind of shelved for a number of years, and it wasn't until Dr. Hara from the International Medical Center of Japan applied it to cancer imaging that uh, it brought us to where we are now. Uh, but choline, um, as a substrate for phosphocholine, appears to have a number of important second messenger roles. Uh, this is evidenced by uh, some experimental observations that I outline here. Um, the blockage of choline kinase by a number of methods, small molecule inhibitors, siRNA, uh, appear to inhibit uh, signaling along uh, a number of cancer-related pathways. So um, probably the most studied area um, for cho uh, choline PET imaging applications is the localization of recurrence. And so I just want to show an example of that where we have two patients, A and B, both have had treatment. As you can see, the treatment was interstitial brachytherapy, and they both uh, n did not um, have a uh, good PSA response, so their PSA never went down to a, a low or unmeasurable level. So we performed choline PET, and in one patient we found a hot spot, and it localized to the base of the prostate. In another patient we found a hot spot, and it localized to the left ischium, and so um, you know this form, uh, this imaging application at this setting is useful because it helps direct the patient to subsequent treatment. This patient could benefit from a, some sort of salvage therapy, while this patient uh, would not, and likely needs a systemic approach to managing his disease. Um, so um, there's been over a dozen studies looking at uh, this uh, state of biochemical recurrence and restaging of cancer with choline PET. Uh, there's a number of system, systematic reviews, and it appears based on the review and, and these individual studies that the sensitivity of detection is related to the PSA level at the time of imaging, and that um, this technique may be more likely to be positive than existing conventional um, techniques at, at any given level of PSA. And so um, in one more uh, recent uh, review, the odds ratio of a fluorocholine PET detecting disease versus a conventional bone scan is about uh, three. And this is one of our earliest scans where uh, probably one of our first 10 patients scanned about 10 years ago uh, using a, a dedicated PET scanner with no PET CT. So we used a rod source for attenuation correction. And uh, we found a hot spot in the lumbar spine as well as activity in the prostate. And this patient had a bone scan 20 days ago, which was essentially normal. But about 12 months later, uh, despite having treatment for um, uh, the prostate cancer with hormonal therapy, we did find um, hot spots lighting up, not just in the spot that we found on the PET, but also in the ischium. And then 20 months later, uh, the patient uh, subsequently de developed multiple metast uh, metastatic lesions throughout the spine and, ac and axial skeleton. So, uh, this is a, just an early example that, that really um, uh, impressed upon me the, the potential of choline PET imaging. And we did find this relationship where um, the likelihood of the PET scan to be positive is much higher when the PSA is uh, greater than a two to four range. Although it is still possible even at very low PSA levels that, uh, to detect disease, but the detection rate is, is, is comparably low. So, um, uh, so I'd like to spend the rest of my talk talking about um, the applications at the very earliest uh, state of prostate cancer as well as at the very late stages. Um, so primary treatment, um, uh, most uh, common treatments are, as you know, prostatectomy and radiation therapy, and the recurrence rates vary uh, according to various prognostic factors. So uh, up to 34% uh, at five years, uh, there's a recurrence a prostate cancer after a radical prostatectomy, and the recurrence rates are, are somewhat comparable after external beam radiation therapy. And so um, with the goal of improving those figures, um, with radiotherapy, you can always try to increase the radiation dose, but with that comes an increased likelihood of, of radiation toxicity and complications. And so the therapeutic ratio, what we are trying to do is try to maximize this difference. Uh, and this is an example of a rectal ulcer from uh, prostate radiation therapy. 
So <clears throat> with higher radiation dose, we get better tumor control, but the complication rates will be unacceptable. If we try to lower that complication rate, then we won't be curing the disease. So it's sort of a balancing act. And even since the early days of conformal radiation therapy, the goal has always been to treat the entire organ that can give rise to the disease. Uh, and so um, we looked at this and read a number of papers where boost therapy, which is the strategy of just treating only the uh, suspected prostate cancer lesion with a higher radiation dose, uh, we thought that was an attractive uh, idea. Um, so we looked at some of the existing protocols, and one of the protocols that uh, um, recently completed was uh, an RTOG protocol comparing high dose to standard dose, so we used that as the basis of designing a boost therapy study. Um, one of the evolutions in radiation therapy delivery is uh, volumetric modulated arc therapy, and uh, according to the, the, the companies uh, selling this technique, it appears to ha be able to achieve superior conformality. And I'm not a radiation oncologist, but looking at some of these dose cloud pictures, it does appear that it's more uniform in treating the prostate, and the uh, radiation cloud outside of the prostate does appear to be uh, more confined with VMAT as compared to standard um, IMRT. And based on the number of monitoring units, it does appear that the, the chances of damaging the normal tissue is, is less using this uh, VMAT approach. So we, um, we wanted to test the number of hypotheses in, in designing a VMAT boost protocol using fluoroquinone. Uh, one is um, whether uh, we can, uh, just from a technical point of view, define an intraprostatic dominant lesion as the target for VMAT dose augmentation. And we wanted to pursue not only uh, a boost, but we wanted to make it a very high boost differential uh, overlaid on top of already a high dose because we believe that VMAT can allow us to pursue higher whole prostate radiation doses. And we wanted to see if we could design the treatment plan so that um, we could apply the same organ at risk uh, dose constraints. And so the, our goal was to kind of skew this therapeutic ratio so we can maximize the tumor control while minimizing the complications. So this is an example of the uh, uh, target volume definitions that we use. Uh, this is the PET scan, and we would contour according to the RTOG uh, 0126 protocol definitions, the prostate and the prostate and seminal vesicles. So we use the same uh, contouring definitions. And then we added our own for the boost, which uh, one is called PTVS60, which is defined by 60% of the SUV threshold based on the intraprostatic uptake of uh, fluoroquinone. And then we wanted to add another boost region within the boost region because we noticed that uh, an SUV 60 threshold and a 70 threshold, uh, that even that small change would uh, define a, a much smaller region within the, the uh, region uh, tumor itself. So we thought this uh, boost zone, we could add even more radiation and our certainty of this being um, the epicenter of the tumor would be also higher if we believe the fluoroquinone PET to be an accurate technique. And also they're, they're, from a radiation delivery standpoint, by confining the maximum point dose to this PTVS70, uh, we may be able to um, uh, uh, put the radiation where it's needed and, and kind of shelter it away from some of the organs at risk. So uh, we designed our treatment plan to be implemented on a standard uh, Varian true beam LINAC. Uh, we used two arcs in most cases. Sometimes we had to go to two and a half arcs and we compared it to a standard RTOG 0126 high dose arm, and this is the dose prescription that that, that um, uh, trial arm used. And ours applied the same prescription plus a boost up to 100 gray for the PTVS60 and 105 gray to the PTVS70. So this is the dose coverage and OAR constraints that we were striving for. We tried to um, achieve the same uh, uh, constraints um, between the uh, boost and non-boost protocol for rectum, bladder, penile bu bulb, and femoral head exposure. And we um, included uh, 30 patients with a spectrum of uh, disease risk, so based on the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network 
guidelines, we included low, intermediate, and high-risk patients. We didn't include the very low or the very high-risk because based on these guidelines, they wouldn't qualify for radiation therapy, uh, but these categories did. We also wanted to include this spectrum of patients just to test the feasibility of using fluoroquinolone PET to define the interprostatic uh, dominant lesion in um, a variety of um, Gleason scores and a variety of patient risk categories. So this is an example of the uh, planning uh, uh, results in comparison to the uh, PET scan images. Uh, this is the axial coronal sagittal views on the PET scan and the uh, uptake um, scale. And then this is the, the uh, dose uh, scale for the radiation planning. So you can see a lot of similarity in the areas of high uptake corresponding to the areas of high dose prescription. Um, on the PET, though, you, you do see the urinary bladder uh, here, uh, which is adjacent to a, uh, the lesion in the prostate. And in this case, this uh, patient had seminal vesicle invasion as well as a lesion in the base of the prostate. And so we treated that whole area. And this com is in comparison to the standard uh, non-boost uh, treatment where the dose to the prostate is very uniform. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is that the maximum point dose, because we are using um, our PTV S70 definition, we, is right in the hot spot of um, where the uh, PET lesion is. And so we're confining the most intense radiation uh, to what we believe is the epicenter of the tumor, where on a standard treatment plan where the PTV is the entire prostate, that um, maximum point dose could be anywhere. So in this uh, slice of the image, it, it happens to be right in the center of the prostate, probably next to the urethra. Uh, one of the questions um, about fluoroquinolone is that it's uh, excreted in the urine, and so that might impair visualization. And indeed, I believe it impairs quantitation, but as, as far as visualization goes, um, it hasn't really been problematic for us. Um, here's the tumor, and as you can see, the bladder on subsequent slices becomes more and more prominent, but we're still able to see um, the prostate gland uh, using uh, modern PET-CT instrumentation. So you can see here the left seminal vesicle invasion right behind the bladder. Um, but it is important to uh, make sure that um, because the, the ureters um, can contain fluorocholine that um, there's a systematic interpretation of, of these images to make sure, uh, especially with um, the, the ureter, that it, you know, that's not mistaken for either a lymph node or even the left seminal vesicle. And so um, we have a, a very systematic way of interpreting our PET images just to make sure that we're not confounded by, by some of these uh, potential uh, uh, interpretation pitfalls. And, and so here's the sagittal image showing, you know, that even though the bladder is, is pretty hot, we can still see the uh, prostate and the prostate cancer. So looking at the uh, uh, dose volume uh, histogram results, we were able to achieve all of our um, uh, prescription goals. Uh, the maximum uh, dose and the PTV S60 uh, exceeded um, 100 gray and in the S70, uh, 105, uh, where the uh, non-boost regions achieved very comparable uh, uh, doses. And looking at the organs at risk, we also achieved uh, the constraints, so there's very comparable uh, dose to the rectum, bladder, and penile bulb. Looking at the dose volume histogram, where the non-boost treatment plan is um, uh, represented by the uh, triangle uh, dot lines and the square dot lines represent the boost treatment, there you can again see that the uh, dose volume relationships for the penile bulb, femoral head, uh, rectum, and bladder are very comparable. And in this case where we had seminal vesicle invasion, you can see that we have much more dose uh, applied to uh, 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 the uh, seminal vesicle uh, using the boost treatment plan. And also uh, the PTV1 and 2, which is the prostate and prostate plus seminal vesicle, also has higher dose. And th this is the boost region itself, showing how steep the dose fall off and, and gradient and the uh, magnitude of dose that we've applied. 
So we were able to maintain a similar dose volume histogram profile for the critical organs that could achieve um, a therapeutic boost. So one question is whether or not these boost regions really represent cancer. So uh, because we were able to correlate with um, some of the uh, pathology in, in these 30 cases, we feel confident that we, we are defining a, um, an appropriate target lesion. So we compared the SUV 60% uh, threshold, and this was based on, on previous studies um, that all seem to agree that this, could out, uh, this was a pretty good threshold for defining the volume of tumor within the prostate uh, based on uh, carbon-11 or fluorine-18 choline PET. And so what we found was um, through correlation with biopsy or step section histology uh, was that this threshold could cover all of the tumor-positive prostate sextants in 27 patients. In one patient, we had to lower the threshold to 50% to cover all of the tumor-positive uh, sextants. And in two patients, uh, we didn't really have the full, step sec uh, the, the full sextant biopsy uh, to, to confirm uh, our uh, um, uh, contouring definition, but um, the urologist in these cases just did one or two biopsies at a palpable nodule, and he felt that he wanted to spare that pa those patients um, uh, more than the minimum amount of necessary needles. So, um, but at least on our correlation, uh, we found that the lobe that was biopsy positive was the lobe that we defined our PTVS60 in. So uh, the radiopathologic correlation with our boost regions seem, uh, based on the limited kind of histopathologic correspondence that we have, it seems pretty reasonable. We did find, however, that in 11 patients, our uh, PTVS60 did include um, biopsy negative prostate sextants. And so this could be interpreted as uh, the PET scan being falsely positive. And it has been reported that uh, choline has uptake in benign lesions, including prostatic hyperplasia and prostatitis. And so uh, we could be over-treating or we could be treating benign disease. But because we were comparing against uh, biopsy as the gold standard, you know, the other uh, possibility is that the biopsies were uh, false negative. And so biopsy sampling error could have produced this apparent histologic discordance with PET. Um, so not knowing which of these is true, uh, we, could, we could assume the worst case scenario that we're overestimating the boost treatment volume that's necessary. And this is a concern because the dose fall off from the region could unnecessarily increase the exposure to adjacent organs at risk and thus increase the normal tissue complication probability. So we, to kind of ad, um, address that possibility, we performed some radiobiologic modeling to estimate the probability of tumor control as well as the probability of the normal tissue complication probability. Uh, we used the BioSuite open source software and we estimated based on clonogen density as well as a range of uh, alpha beta ratios uh, what the probabilities of tumor control and complication were. Uh, and this is a graph of the results. So what we found was that in the boost region, the probability of tumor control was much higher uh, with um, the boost dose treatment. Looking at the boost region, which is just the normal treated region in the uh, non-boost treatment plan, uh, it's about in the 85% range, and there's probably a 10% increase in uh, probability of tumor control using boost therapy. Um, we did find that the lower alpha beta ratios, which is probably more um, uh, appropriate for what prostate cancer biologically is, there is a slightly higher um, degree of tumor control. Uh, but um, with the number of fractions, we use 39 fractions, uh, this difference is probably not as great as with um, uh, hypofractionation. In the uh, boost region, within the boost region, the IDL SUV70, we found even higher probability of tumor control exceeding 97%. And then even outside of the boost region, probably, probably as a result of the dose fall off from the boost region, we found improved tumor control. And in comparing the probability of the normal tissue complication, we found comparable uh, probabilities of rectal complications as well as uh, uh, bladder and femoral head uh, complications between the non-boost and boost treatment plan. So uh, to summarize, um, we found that 
high dose, uh, incorporating fluorocholine as the way to define the interperstatic dominant lesion is technically feasible up to 105 gray, and that our radiobiologic models show incre an increase in the tumor control probability with, and comparable uh, normal tissue complication probabilities between the treatment plans. We felt that the nested boost contours were helpful because it helped approximate the boost region to the uh, uh, PET-defined lesion as well as increase the boost dose differential, and we could also be more certain where the maximum point dose was located within our uh, treatment volumes and thus possibly limit the organ at risk exposure. And while we did find that the PET may overestimate the volumes of the dominant lesion because of that possibility of a false positive increase uptake in prostatic hyperplasia, we found no corresponding penalty in terms of the normal tissue complication probability. And so we observed that the VMAT uh, using VMAT that the boost treatment plan could accommodate the same uh, dose constraints as the non-boost treatment plan. So going to the other side of the spectrum, and the goal of dose augmentation is to avoid reaching this phase, but a significant number of patients do hit this um, region where um, their survival curves, everything is, is sort of reset, and it's a very different disease as compared to early disease. Um, this. Uh, state of prostate cancer is also a, uh, there's a lot of advancements in, in treatment, and so it's an exciting area to do research in. Uh, so deaths from prostate cancer, the majority are due to metastatic complications, most often from bone. The morbidity is due to fractures, anemia, compromise of the immune system, frailty and pain. And conventional imaging has difficulty in detecting uh, bone metastasis until the PSA reaches above 10 to 20 range. Uh, lymph nodes can also cause morbidity through obstructive complications, but uh, the mor morbidity is, is by far due to either bone metastases or the less common visceral metastases. Since 2004, there have been the approval of a number of agents shown to both prolong survival as well as improve quality of life, beginning with docetaxel chemotherapy, uh, cipolusol T, immuno immunotherapy, other chemotherapy, and advanced uh, hormonal and antiandrogenic agents, and most recently with uh, radioisotope therapy using radium-223. Uh, one of the current problems in treating advanced cancers is deciding how and when to administer these agents, how to sequence them, how to select the patients. Um, radium is a little bit easier because it has a very narrow FDA indication, and it's approved only for patients with symptomatic skeletal metastases without any known visceral metastases. So this one's a little bit easier to define the treatment population, but I've seen these agents used in various sequences and combinations. So in the era of, era of biomarkers, uh, you know, we're pursuing this concept called precision medicine where the need for diagnostic tools to help clinicians select and optimally sequence their treatments and monitor their activity is, is an area of a lot of active research. And we also need better tools to help decide when it's even appropriate to treat since many of these patients have competing mortality risks. And so we're looking for predictive biomarkers to predict which treatments will work, therapeutic biomarkers to show their activity in real time while we're administering the treatments, as well as prognostic biomarkers to tell us where the patients are in relation to uh, their chances of, of a good outcome. So um, imaging hasn't really played a significant role as a biomarker, but with whole body imaging, I think there are possible ways to use imaging as a whole body biomarker. So taking from what's been um, accomplished in FDG PET imaging, there's this concept of the metabolically active tumor volume where all of the lesions uh, can be thresholded and segmented to define the volume of abnormalities, essentially. And so if you look at two patients, and in, in this patient A, you see a couple lesions in the spine, the ribs, in the pelvis, and you look at this patient who has his entire axial skeleton involved with tumor plus some lymph nodes here and retroperitoneal lymph nodes, if you had to make a guess which one is more likely to die of their disease, you would uh, obviously say this one. And based on the PSA level, this has a PSA of 28, and this patient has a PSA of 4.9, you know, even by uh, conventional biomarkers, he's at greater risk. 
Uh, but using PET, we could segment all of these lesions, and so the color coding here is actually not related to intensity of uptake, but just uh, to define where uh, the segmented lesions are. We could add up all of these segmented volumes and come up with a number, uh, uh, which is the net metabolically active tumor volume. So we could estimate that this patient has approximately 54 cc's of tumor within his skeleton, while this patient has almost um, a liter of tumor within his skeleton. And taking that number, we could try to see if it corresponds uh, to uh, survival. In Hawaii, we're part of the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results uh, Network from the National Cancer Institute, and that takes about uh, a dozen or, or so states throughout the United States. There's Hawaii right there. Um, and uh, it's by state and federal mandate, uh, we collect survival data as well as treatment data on all uh, patients with a cancer diagnosis. And so we're able to follow these patients very easily. Very few people also move from Hawaii, so it's really easy to do follow-up. And so, um, <laughs> so um, we uh, follow them for a period of about five years. And, and looking at these patients, the mean PSA at 565, they're relatively old, and the, um, that you know, they, they probably would declare themselves uh, in terms of mortality within our follow-up interval. And so we, even looking at PSA, when we do survival analysis, those who began with a PSA of greater than 28 were more, significantly more likely to die than those with lower PSA. Uh, but taking the uh, measures that we've obtained from PET, we did the survival analysis and also found that uh, those patients with a metabolic tumor volume greater than 255 cc's were significantly more likely to, to die of their disease, or actually this is overall survival, so to, to die um, uh, than those with a, a lower tumor volume. And then we also took a measure that we called total lesion activity, which is based on an FDD, FDG PET measure called total lesion glycolysis, which is essentially just the tumor volume multiplied by the uptake value on the PET scan. And that measure is also predictive of survival. And uh, because this is a small study with only 30 patients, we really couldn't do a lot of extensive multivariate analysis, but looking at just univariate connect corrections, we found that adjusting PSA for these uh, tumor volume uh, PET measures, the significance of PSA diminished, but taking these measures and adjusting them for PSA, they remain statistically significant. And so we found these to be uh, potentially having enough uh, statistical independence as a potential prognostic marker. Uh, interestingly, we found that the tr because no, um, all of these patients subsequently underwent treatment after the PET scan, we, but we found that um, none of these treatments had a significant difference relative to each other in terms of improving survival, and that's probably um, to be expected since all of the treatments for advanced prostate cancer only prolong survival by an order of uh, two to three months. So in addition to looking at uh, this form of whole body PET quantitation as a prognostic biomarker, we could also serially uh, monitor these patients actively during treatment and monitor the changes in their tumor volume uh, as a delta MATV and look and see if whether or not this change is also predictive of the treatment outcome and survival. So we, we haven't published this yet, but have had some abstracts showing that a 30% decline in the tumor volume during chemotherapy treatment is a predictor of survival. And this is an example of, of maybe one of the more impressive responses. This is a unique patient because he doesn't have bone metastases. He only has lymph node metastases. So it's not the typical prostate cancer uh, advanced stage case, but after three doses of of chemotherapy, uh, this is essentially a normal fluorocholine scan. And so you, you can see, at least by imaging, some remarkable changes in the tumor, but um, you know, that's a unique case, as I mentioned. And the more typical observations, especially in bone metastases, is a heterogeneous response. So here's an example. In the pretreatment scan, we see two lesions, one in the femur, one in the ischium. After just one cycle of docetaxel, uh, that femur lesion is already starting to show diminished activity. This one's a little bit persistent. And after three cycles, this one is essentially normalized and this one is still abnormal. So what we usually see is this kind of pattern where 
the um, individual tumors are changing, um, not necessarily in concert. And so we suspect this is probably due to chemo resistance, but, but we really don't know at this time. But one of the treatments um, that's uh, probably the most recently introduced treatment is alpha emitter therapy using radium. And radium is an alpha emitting isotope, has a limited range but a high energy, it has a radiologic biologic effectiveness of 50, uh, which, um, and it causes double st strand DNA breaks, meaning that there is no resistance mechanism. If the isotope is there, the, the tumor cell will be killed. And so it's approved by the US FDA for treatment of bone metastases because radium is a calcium mimetic and it only goes to areas of actively remodeling bone. And so once the radium's there, uh, within the two to 10 cell diameter range, uh, these cells are killed by exposure to alpha radiation. And the phase three trial showed that it not only does it improve overall survival, but it also delays the time to the first skeletal related event by uh, almost six months here. And it seems effective across a variety of patient subgroups. So we, we're, we're beginning to scan patients that we've treated with radium uh, using fluoroquinolone to see what kind of response we could see uh, early on in the course of that kind of treatment. And so here's an example of our um, tumor burden uh, imaging where uh, these red areas, again, it's not the intensity of uptake, but it's just the abnormal areas uh, outlined through image segmentation. And what you can see here, and this is the standard PEP uh, intensity projection image, so you can see very high intensity in the uh, humeri, in the long bones here in the pelvis. And after three months, uh, full course of radium is about six months, so midway in treatment, what we do see is persistence of the uh, upper extremity abnormalities, even some con increase in the confluence of some of these lesions. So you can see they're very in intense compared to uh, the baseline. But we also notice that in the pelvic metastases, they've decreased in intensity. So this patient appears to be having that heterogeneous response that I described in, in an earlier patient. And you can see here in the spine, one lesion appears to have nearly disappeared while another one appears to persist. You can see it here on the PET-CT as well. And looking at his other biomarkers, um, it's, it's somewhat consistent. The PSA level went from 2,500 to 2,300. The ALKFOS didn't normalize, it remained elevated. And alkaline phosphatase is a, a blood marker of bone turnover. And in our measurements, the tumor volume went from 270 uh, cc's to 240 cc's. So contrast this with uh, the next patient where, um, you know, he has a, started out with a lower PSA in 40 and, uh, and a fewer number of lesions. Uh, but after three months of treatment, you can see um, that at least by image segmentation, none of those lesions are there anymore. Uh, there's a little bit of um, activity maybe in this mid-thoracic spine. And you can see on these PET-CT images, these lesions here have normalized. There's an increase in sclerosis of the bone in, in, in those spots, uh, reflective of, of some healing. And his PSA went to 2.8 from 40. His alkaline phosphatase became normal, and his tumor volume went, to, went down from 260 to 0.8 cc's. And so um, you know, both patients are alive and doing well. Both actually feel better. You know, this patient, he couldn't even unfold his hands because of the uh, shoulder pain, and now after three months, he was more comfortable lying in the scanner. So, um, you know, we, we've only treated these patients recently, and this is the first time I've shown these images to anyone. So we're gonna continue following these patients to see if, if these kinds of measurements with radium therapy are also uh, predictive in some manner. Uh, so as... Uh, as a potential imaging biomarker, I think PET has to show complementary value to the existing biomarkers. There's Gleason, PSA, alkaline phosphatase, measures of uh, bone marrow production and nomograms derived from all of these markers. And so PET does have some advantages and to help complement these other more global measures. It's not only does it provide whole body surveillance, but it anatomically annotates the biological information, shows us where the tumors are. And so it's a non-invasive method to individualize uh, the biomarker, not just to the patient, but to, the to individual tumors and help reveal their treatment uh, vulnerability since a lot of treatments are headed towards combinations. 
But to really fully apply PET as a biomarker, I think we have to further understand its underlying biology. Um, uh, uh, so for uh, choline PET, as I mentioned earlier, it may have a cell signaling role. And so we're doing a number of studies to help uh, investigate that. In liver cancer, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, choline appears to also have avid uptake. And so these are primary liver cancers here um, on a choline PET scan. Um, these patients often go to surgery, and so we have an opportunity to, to do not just radiopathologic uh, correlation, but now we have the opportunity to do radiogenomic correlation using um, whole genome arrays. So we're trying to investigate uh, what the uh, gene expression patterns are underlying this abnormal PET signal, and maybe we can uncover uh, some of these other potential uh, mechanisms that uh, phosphocholine is involved in, and our initial um, pathway analysis just suggests, this is AKT right here, does suggest um, a significant role of AKT in reflecting the PET signature uh, in correspondence to the gen genomic signature. So I'd like to acknowledge, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a small community hospital in, in Honolulu, and so much of my work is dependent on collaboration. Uh, so at my medical center, it's mostly the nuclear medicine and radiology department and we've collaborated with the Army Medical Center in Hawaii, as well as the uh, Central Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, D.C. Um, Hawaii is part of a clinical translational research network supported by uh, National Institutes of Health, and so we uh, benefited much from the, the medical physics expertise um, at uh, University of Nevada. We collaborate with the University of Hawaii and um, have been fortunate to receive U.S. government research funding support to do the research that I've presented. So I think I'll stop there. And